Welcome. This is the second episode in our series on D3, and possibly the most important one. In this episode, I'll take you through the concept of D3 joins. Lots of people think the D3 API is a bit weird when they first try it out. Don't feel ashamed if you feel or felt this way too, it's a normal reaction. But understanding the concept of joins will bring a lot of clarity to the API. When I talk about joins, I'm referring to the update pattern of D3. In a nutshell, this pattern works like this. You do a select on your DOM, then you join the select with your current data. Based on this join, you can do three kind of updates. The reason for D3 working this way is so that you can update your rendering with the latest representation of your data. And if that data changes, it doesn't need to re-render everything. It will be able to handle that by dealing only with the deltas of your data. It's actually really cool if you think about it. It makes it more declarative. So I've mentioned you can do three kinds of updates. The most common action is adding items that are available in your data and not represented in the DOM yet. You do this with enter. The reason for this being the most common is because if you are rendering anything with D3, you need to call enter for a data item to be represented on the screen. When there are items that came back from your DOM selection that are not present in your data, you can get to them with the exit function. A common action here is to remove those items from the DOM, but you can always just style them differently or replace them with something else, based on your scenario. And lastly, to get to the items that are already on your DOM and still present in your data, you can just work with the initial result of the join, meaning a select joined with a data call. You can then choose to style them differently or as is common, just leave them alone. So let's dive in. In our previous episode, we left off after we set up a really cool environment for D3 development. And we got it to a point where we can code up some D3 code in ES6, style it with SAS, and have it hosted with auto reload. All this we did with Gulp.js. Let's remove what we did over here in the draw function which as you recall, is a common pattern for D3 coding and where we'll be doing most of our work. We're gonna be working with some real screencast data from TagTree. So we declare a variable called screencasts over here. I'm opting to create this variable at this scope because it will allow us to update this variable later on and call draw again to see how our update logic handles it. Now we use the JSON function on D3 to make a XHR request to this URL at tag tree, bringing back the data we need, already passed two objects from a JSON formatted response we got from the server. So you don't need to pull in something like jQuery just because you want to get some data from a URL and pass some JSON. The second parameter to this call is a callback function that works with the data. Because we pulled in Tracer in a previous episode, we get to enjoy using the arrow syntax for declaring this function. And this argument that the function expects, we call data. This contains the deserialized JSON. In our case, this will contain an array of screencasts, which are objects containing a title of the screencast and the number of times it has been viewed. First we want to target the container element because we want to add a list to this element based on our data. So we use a CSS selector just like with jQuery. This is the element we want to be targeting right over here. We then call append on it and add an unordered list. There's a reason we are doing this in here and not in our draw function. This is setting up a one-time thing. We don't want to be adding a list every time we call draw. We want to do it once. So we've set up our structure by creating a list in the DOM. 
Now we want to make sure that our screencast records are sorted according to popularity, having the most popular items at the top. We use the native array sort function and again provide a callback function using the arrow syntax. Because we want the most popular items first, we return b.viewCount minus a.viewCount for the compare result. If we wanted it to be sorted in ascending order, we would have returned a.viewCount minus b.viewCount. It's a bit weird, I know. In subsequent episodes, we'll use Lodash for stuff like this. At last. Now we can call draw, passing in this array. In draw, we get a handle to our list we created earlier, as we want to be adding items to that list for each screencast we've got in our data. This is where we're going to start doing the join logic, so pay attention. This is the weird part, but I'm going to take you through it nice and slow. On the D3 element that represents the list, we now call select all. We use select all because we know we're working with an array, and that we will want to be able to represent our data with multiple items. In here, we specify that we want to find allies. We know they won't exist yet, but that's fine. Because it works with a join, once we've joined this empty result with our data, it will give us an opportunity to add the new items. Now we've got a selection of the items that we want to represent in our data, we throw data onto the chain. What we've got here is a join. It's a selection of our DOM matched to data. The first time this draw method executes, it won't have any list items, so the join will be empty on the representation side, and full on the data side. At this point we close this off with a semicolon. We want our variable to contain the join, so that I can show you how it handles changes to the data later on. Most of the D3 code you will see will chain enter directly on here and start rendering stuff. That's because most D3 examples show you how to render something once, not how to have something that updates over time. Now we can use our join and get a handle to the items that need to be added. This we do by calling enter on the join. We action the enter selection by appending list items for each data item not represented in the DOM yet. We call the text function providing it with a function which takes the data item we want to reflect. In here we use another ES6 construct, template strings, which enables us to put our dynamic tokens directly into the string where we want it to display. This is a bit more elegant than doing string concatenation. When we save this out, you can see that we've got a list populated with our formatted strings, representing a screencast and a view count for each. Sweet, so we've done a select, joined it up with data, and used enter to add the new items to the DOM. So that was enter. Let's have a look at exit. As mentioned earlier, you get to items that have been removed from the data, but still represented in the selection by calling exit on the join, like this. A common action on the exit result is to call remove. But we want to do something different to show you that it's alive and not just re-rendering from scratch every time. So we use the adder function, which allows us to set a class on each item that's in the DOM, but not present in the data anymore. Now, like with the text function, you can pass a function to this, that it can evaluate the data that's been removed, but we're not going to do that. We'll just set the same class on each deleted item to enable us to style it differently. The class name we specify is called deleted. Let's go declare the class in our SAS file. All we want to do is show that it's been deleted. So let's just use a text decoration rule with a line through. Now check this out. I go into the console and update the screencast array 
by calling splice on it to remove a whole bunch of items from it. Next I call the draw function, passing it the updated array. And there you go, as you can see the items that have been deleted are still there, but have been styled differently. That's quite powerful because it shows you that it's keeping track of the DOM items and its related data, allowing us to do stuff like this. And that's it for this episode. I hope by now you get how important this concept is and why the API is a bit weird when you start out. The whole join concept should be much clearer to you now. I know I'm looking forward to the upcoming D3 episodes. See you next time.